I wanted to read this book because of the current political situation in the United States. Uh, Klaus Thelowet, I guess, I'm not sure how to say his name, but he wrote a history of sort of militia movements, I guess. I haven't read it yet, but uh, a sort of interwar history of Germany and social developments that presaged the rise of fascism. And my thought was that if I made a project of reading this fairly dense text, I would be more likely to finish it. My thought was that uh, the print edition of the book cost $50, and I found it online on Monoscope, but that if I read it out loud, it would be easier than reading something on my screen uh, in my head. I feel like I would have a much easier time if it was physically printed reading a dense text. And then I thought that if I made a project of reading it out loud, I could share it with you and that perhaps it would be useful to other people who wanted to read this text. So I created a forum, which is klausthelowet.proboards.com. I'll put the link in the bottom of the video after each video if you would care to discuss it with me. I just thought this could be a nice project for the month of August. So I'll just read the preface, the first portion, very minor portion of the book today, and see how that goes. There's a quote from Vlado Crystal from Sekundin Filma. Let's hope that power trips everyone's alarm someday. And then the text begins. Along the Hindenburg Dam, which isn't visible in the frontispiece, the trains travel back and forth between the island of Sleit and the terra firma of schweizig holstein I found that picture postcard of the train on the dam at high tide while looking through my mother's photo albums this spring. She was already unconscious from a stroke, and on that journey there is no journey. When people die, we look at their photo albums and hear the voices that belonged to the images. Kate Ni Munuth, 11th child of a tailor from Kranz, Kranz, where people from Kronisberg went to enjoy the Baltic waters, 1900 to 1977, would have liked to have lived to see this work and the attendant doctorate completed, and to fulfill her dream of reaching a hundred, a dream she mentioned less and less in recent years. The picture postcard was loosely inserted in the album among the pictures of the immediate family. A photo of Hindenburg, one of my earliest heroes, hung above the desk of my father, the railroad man, with a facsimile signature I long considered genuine. Paul von Hindenburg, field marshal, had signed a picture for my father. The thought pleased me. Alongside of Hindenburg himself, himself a dam, a soldier dam connecting one Reich with another across the red floods of the Weimar Republic, hung Bismarck and Frederick the Great, where the Führer's portrait must have hung at one time. In 1954, my father proudly showed the Hindenburg Dam In 1954, my father proudly showed the Hindenburg Dam to my sister Hilga and I, not as if it were his property, but as if he himself were the railway in whose train we were sitting and under which the dam belonged. I was 12, and this is the only time I remember being at the seashore with my father. He never went into the water on silt. It was too rough for him, and besides, he was no great fan of it. The illegitimate son of an East Prussian estate holder, my father was raised by an aunt. As a father himself, he was therefore all in favor of having a proper family. But he was primarily a railroad man, body and soul, as he put it, and only secondarily a man. 
He was a good man, too, and a pretty good fascist. The blows he brutally lavished as a matter of course and for my own good were the first lessons I would one day come to recognize as lessons in fascism. The insistences of ambivalence in my mother She considered the beatings necessary, but tempered them with a second. Honest public servant that he was, he didn't even cheat at cards, scat, and double cough the way she did. Often in my favor, so I put up with it. A disappointed public servant in the end, not even his last boss cared about a lifetime of service. He succumbed to alcohol and to German history. Bruno, 1901 to 1966. None of his sons wanted to be a rail railroad man. The youngest of my three older brothers became one anyway. The trade he'd learned, dairy management, had become a career with no future, that is, with no present. Is not a body and soul railroad man. My older siblings were born for the coming Reich that somehow never came. Reinhold, Reinhold Siegfried, Brunhilde, Gunther, Neiblingen, 1929-1935. The two latecomers were given the names of defeat, Klaus and Ilga, 1942 and 1944, children of Stalingrad. Out of Stalingrad came Elvis, the movies, the rest of America, from screens and loudspeakers across the big ocean, along the dam that isn't visible in the picture, Monica Kubla, also crossed over to the mainland, drawn from the island she'd lived on for 18 years, to the same city whose university had attracted me, Kiel, like the things ships have underneath. For Spellbound, Hitchcock secured the collaboration of Dali, who was to do the dream sequences for him. Hard, pointed, jagged, they were to penetrate the surface of the everyday world, just like the mountain the train glides past in this film, rooted, one dynamic space moving through another. The railroad and film The railroad and film must have common roots. Unfortunately, Freud wrote only about the railroad, and about how the unconscious stores its painstakingly gathered representations of the self. Iris Henderson has her monogram sewn onto her pockets, scarves, and handkerchiefs as if these things could help her to safeguard her identity. If verisimilitude dares to raise its ugly head, if you reject my view of this film as mere fantasizing, then of course I am defenseless. That's uh, Frida Gaffa, Gaffa on The Lady Vanishes in Film Critic 12 from 1971. Jimmy, after you've gone through all the hell of dying, and you've got to find out and face the facts to start a nationwide rebirth. But I'm not a politician, you see. All I can say is what I've been seeing. Common sense. Interviewer. But the masses are really saying just the opposite. Jimmy, you know who is really living in a fantasy land? It's the damn masses. The masses. The point is who is wrong and who is right. That's what the point is, not how many people... What I'm trying to say is that somebody has got to make a move. The others are just waiting around until you run to jelly. Then they tick you off. Jimi Hendrix in an interview in Circus, March 1969. When I hear Monica talking about her clinical experience, when I hear Monica talking about her clinical experience, it is not only academic theories of fascism that begin to appear in me. The very idea of producing a critique of them seems equally trivial. In fact, the whole effort would be superfluous if we had a convention for understanding and behaving, a way of listening that sense the significance of all this for the theoretical pronouncements we deliver from on high. Children committed to psychiatric care whose articulate in the language of the deviant or the dumb a whole system of disabilities that make up this life, and who carry that system about with them in their own hopelessly rebellious bodies, expressing it in images that compel any viewer to perceive their sickness as a superior form of innocent wholeness, through their bodies are said to have broken down, 
when she tells me of contact, true contact, with lightning and rolling thunder, of the production of an intimacy through the feeling and exploration of distances. An intimacy that is not consuming, distance that is not far away, a place where caution is a beautiful world, related to foresight and to a feeling for the reality of suffering that wishes for change but is caught in impasse and double bind. I think then of the steadied or hectic nonchalance of all those, myself included, who are striving to combat fascism here and now, but are blind to the experience of the non-fascist. At this point the sentence seems to want to continue, I begin to despair, but this is the reality of a frozen semantics, not in the end of any feeling I might have. Monica consistently confronted me with her different reading of the manuscript. Whether I handed her quotes, half-finished sections, reworked pages, or finished copy, she seldom reacted as I had hoped and expected. The things I bypassed were often the ones that said most to her, unperturbed. She pronounced ambivalent, the very passages in which I aimed to reveal self-evident truth, passages where I had developed brilliant formulations that I was now forced to abandon. I have a very ambivalent attitude toward the word ambivalence. Monica and Margaret Berger, veterans of clinical work with children, were also the ones who gave me the most support whenever I, a person with no clinical experience, ventured to reformulate accepted psychoanalytic views on the fascist type, fascistic type. I was working with nothing but patients, of course. Soldier males wrote their memoirs in that form without realizing it and with the terror enacted by these men. I'm especially indebted to Margaret Berger for her generally positive reaction to my thought on the ego structure of the not yet fully born in volume two, as well as for her references to the psychoanalytic literature. From time to time, I would find a manila envelope in my mailbox. The envelope had one, sometimes two, steno pads in which Erhard Lucas had relayed his reactions. Concise and friendly, or sharp, when he found something he didn't like. The portions of the manuscript I had shipped off to him in Oldenburg. The book began as a chapter on, chapter on white terror for Lucas's Mars Revolution 1920. When it grew beyond that, he followed its progress in the way that I, given a choice, would have wanted a ready critic colleague to follow it. The book is dedicated to Erhard Lucas, without whom it would have never been written. And that's the uh, preface.